Dark Herald Tribune. How does the problem of communism in the United States compare with the problem of communism in other countries, and is there more than one solution? First of all, from the United Kingdom, is Peter Hudson. Next to him, this tall boy from Norway, is Gunnar Aslan. He's been staying at Bentley High School, as you can see from that enormous button that he seems to be wearing on his lapel. This is Vangalia Ram from India. He's just spent his final day in Pearl River. Pearl River High School gave him such a beautiful present, a traveling clock, that he's especially pleased and proud with that. Finally, here's Johnny Antelone from the Philippines. Well, uh, how about it, boys? Uh, how does America's communist problem compare with the communist problem in your countries? Um, the problem of communism in the United States is a psychological problem. The problem of communism in India is essentially born of frustration a direct consequence of uh, British imperialism. I'll take you up on that in a minute. Well, um, in Britain, the problem is more or less the same as in America, only in Britain. The difference is we don't call it a problem. Well, I would say that the communist problem in America is much more difficult than our own problem, because in the Philippines, the communists <coughs> act in the open, while here in America, they remain hidden. Actually, I don't think the communist problem in America is more difficult than in Norway. I think the real problem lies in the way you are handling communism. Coming back to what you said, Johnny, I thought you said that the problem of uh, communism in the United States was more difficult. How would you, I mean, suggest a remedy for that? Well, I will not sit you like a prophet and tell you what to do about your own problem. I do not pretend to know all the solutions against communism, although I will say that one of the best ways to combat communism is to take a militant stand against it. And one of the best ways to show your militant stand is to outlaw every communist party in every country in the world. No, no. By doing that, you're using communist methods against the communists, which is defeating your very purpose. It is highly undemocratic, I think, to outlaw the communists, because that is the essence of democracy, to have difference and to give the opportunity for expression. I know, so? I know, but there should also be such a thing as limiting freedom. There is a distinction between freedom and license. A rattlesnake is dangerous. It would be undemocratic to limit its freedom in theory, but it is also wise to limit a rattlesnake's freedom. Yes, but uh, you are not taking it for granted that every communist mm. is a traitor. I am not quite sure of that. I think it is wrong to persecute a whole group because of uh, some mistakes on the part of its uh, members. I don't doubt that there are communists who spy against the country. I don't doubt that there are communists who uh, conspire to overthrow the government. But you cannot persecute a group as a whole because some of its members are criminals. Criminals should be punished as criminals and you shouldn't uh, persecute people for the sake of their opinions. And another thing, if you take the human rights away from the communists. Well, why should the communists be interested in preserving democracy? I think that if you take away from the communists the freedom of expression, they will turn traitors. I want to say that the communists already are traitors. They cannot turn into further traitors. I want to bring out this point. I want to state that every communist party in every country of the world is not a self-contained unit in itself. It is a branch of a world conspiracy with headquarters in Moscow. And the best way to cut off the body is by cutting off its arms. But there's one thing, Johnny. You see, you can, you can prosecute a certain person only the moment he becomes subversive to law and order. But not till then. Till then it is his right to express himself, at least in a democracy, if it claims to be a democracy. The minute a man joins a society with the avowed purpose of killing you and cutting your throat, he becomes a traitor to that society. He puts himself outside the pale and protection of the society because he totally rejects it. But only after he makes an explicit statement of his purpose. And does and not he not make then. an explicit statement by joining it, by signing up for it, by giving an oath that he's going to turn against this government? Peter's been trying to get a word Isn't in here. explicit enough? I don't think so. You can't punish a man until he's committed a crime. At least in Britain you can't. You can't punish him for the thought. I'm not punishing him for the thought. I'm just saying that he's joined an association of murderers. For instance, here is a group of ten men. They've drawn up a plan to cut your throat. 
then one man of the ten actually goes out and cuts your throat. Does it stand to reason that the other nine should be irresponsible or should be free from the blame? I don't accept your premise that they're out to cut our throats. And what else do you think that they're supposed to do? When they want to overthrow our society, overthrow our government, institute their own regime, institute their own reign of terror, what else do you want? There are more ways of cutting a throat than simply drawing a knife across it. Well, but those people who plan to do this are individual persons. You cannot persecute the group as a whole because these individual persons are criminals. I know. How do you do deal with them in Norway, Gunnar? Well, um, in uh, Norway, uh, of course, we are quite afraid of communism because uh, Norway has a border with Russia and we are in quite a dangerous position. But um, uh, it is uh, more of a security problem. There are not uh, too many communists. The Communist Party is very small and it is decreasing from election to election. As I said, the problem is the security problem. But I think that uh, the best way of dealing with communism as such a problem is to handle it in secret. I think it is terribly wrong to leave it to politicians because politicians will always be on the look for votes and publicity. And uh, they uh, will make so much fuss about their affairs that any intelligent and uh, dangerous uh, traitor will uh, ge get into a safe hiding place a long time before it comes to an investigation. So therefore, I believe that the communist investigation should be carried on in secret. By the way, if I may put in a word about Gunnar saying that, not, that you should not prosecute the Communist Party because the individuals carry it out. I do say that even if the individuals are the ones who commit the crime, they do so upon the orders of the party and according to the plans of the party. Remember that a party is composed of individuals. Whatever the individuals do, the party is guilty of. The party is not an abstract idea. Whatever its members commit, then that is what it is guilty of. And then your second point, Gunnar, about saying that investigation of communists should, should not be left to politicians, I agree with that. And I want to add something more. I want to say that it should never be the function of the legislature of any country to inspect or to ferret out communists. It should be left to the executive branch. And then the execu executive branch should gather the evidence, while the judicial branch should find out how to evaluate this evidence and then prosecute the man as he should be prosecuted but a man should never be put in a position where his innocence or guilt is in the shadows. He should never be placed in a position where, whether judged guilty or innocent, he's still condemned in the eyes of society. A man should be tried only by the courts, because only the courts have the power to say whether a man is definitely guilty or definitely innocent. Any other way would be judgment by anticipation. Uh, no, John, it is a difference between feasibility and morality. But returning to your point of conducting the the, the investigation in secret, I think that is entirely undemocratic. Because who is going to conduct them? Is, is it the people or the government? Wait and if it is a democracy, then it should be the people and not the government. Wait and well, therefore it should be in the public. I, I thought that in any orderly state you had a police and you <coughs> most... Right. And I uh, most certainly didn't believe that it was left to the people to catch criminals. I thought that the police was there to protect the people. He didn't mean a secret trial, Ram, I'm Precisely. sure. Precisely. He meant, Ram, the secret gathering of evidence. But the actual trial of the men, the actual presentation of the evidence, will be brought before the public. Yes, it should be brought See? before the public. Yes. And I think there are things that are still worse than outlawing the Communist Party. I think that it is still worse when you don't have any lines to operate according to. When you don't know what is right and what is wrong. When you don't know what you will be suspected for and what can pass. I was rather shocked after I came here once when I talked to a boy who didn't dare to go to a Russian movie because he had parents in the State Department. Another time I um, heard uh, a congressional subcommittee ask a person whether she had ever uh, uh, had uh, a, a certain newspaper, ever subscribed on a certain newspaper. And I was shocked about it because I thought that in any democratic country there would be such a freedom of expression that anybody could have the newspaper he wanted to. 
Well, personally, I think uh, outlawing the Communist Party is lazy. It just stresses the incompetence of a country to deal with it. But I want to get on to Ram about this uh, British imperialism. Would you explain what you meant well, by just it? Just a minute, <clears throat> please, Peter. Why are you going to attack my point and transfer your argument to Rav? Isn't that unfair? No, it is related no. to it. Oh, wait a minute. Give Johnny one word. Go ahead, Johnny. He said that outlawing the Communist Party is a lazy method of fighting the Communist Party. I don't think so. I think you're taking a definite stand against it. And you're giving all your actions a legal basis. Where does laziness come in? Well, you're because... Well, you see... When you have a communist party in the country, that uh, party is a real danger. That's but right. the communist party can never be prosperous unless uh, there is some dissatisfaction in the country, unless there is poverty and illiteracy. And therefore, the government has to deal with this poverty and this illiteracy in order to defeat communism. Therefore, I think that communism is not at all doing only bad things. But if you outlaw the communist party, you, you simply don't get this benefit. Look, what no. I... Wait, all right, give Peter a chance. All right, Peter. When I say it's lazy, I mean it's just pushing the issue further away by outlawing it. You said the situation in America was more difficult because communists are hidden here. That's right. If you outlaw your communist party, all you'll do in effect will be to drive it underground, away from being in the open, to behind the scenes, and then and you have a problem really difficult. That isn't so. Now look, you contradict yourself. If it is really so that it would drive them underground, then instead of being lazy about it, why not let them stay in the open? Because that way we could catch them easier, according to your reasoning. Yes. However, you said that by outlawing them, that would drive them underground, and therefore would make it harder to catch them. That's why I mean. Is not? Now let me point out that it is harder to catch the man when he's underground. So the element of laziness does not enter into when it. When I said lazy, I meant that you were pushing the issue further away. You are not pushing the issue further away when you recognize a danger and you take steps to mitigate that danger. To push the danger further away from yourself, you're not doing anything by outlawing When you recognize that the man is a fever, that is not pushing the issue away. You that, but oh, you can't just say, I recognize he has the fever, and then leave it at that Precisely. point in an isolation But war. you can do this. You can say, I recognize he has the fever, I recognize it is bad, and because it is bad, I will take measures to prevent its further spread. And not do anything to him. Pre why not do anything to him? Cure him. But you're just curing him by outlawing the, the fever like that. No, the point is this. By outlawing him, you recognize it's evil. And the minute you recognize it's evil, you take steps to remove that evil. Do you want to tell us what you're doing in the Philippines, Johnny? Well, it might take a little bit long, but I'll just give the general background. I'd like to say that a few years ago, the, Philipp the civilians in the Philippines were more afraid of their army than they were of the communists. This was because the army had committed abuses against the civilian population. But a few years ago, a, a man was sent to the Philippines, and one, of the, one of our Filipino leaders, and he cleaned out the army by reorganizing it. That man's name is Magsay Sai, and he's now our president. The first thing he did was to make it punishable by death for a firing squad, the abuse of any civilian by any soldier. After a few court martials and a few executions before the firing squad, discipline was restored in the army. He did many more things to restore the morale of the army. He removed the subversives within it, and then he divided the army into small compact units with, which could strike with deadly efficiency and deadly mobility at any point within the Philippines. But that was not Strike for what, Johnny? Strike against any communist in any part of the Philippines. I see. There was a time when the army was such a big mass that it was unwieldy. But by dividing it into small, efficient compartments, he could distribute it anywhere with fast mobility. But you, you didn't tell us that there were uh, guerrilla communists all over the Philippines, and that that was the reason why he had to do this with the army. Yes, that's Now tell us how he dealt with the guerrillas. Now, the point is this, it is not enough to kill a communist. As much as possible, it would be better to bring a communist alive and change him to your ways of thinking. So what Magsay Sai did was this. He put in a program of land reform, which in simple terms was this. He said, for every communist without a criminal record, there is a piece of land for himself and for his family. Therefore, if that person has no criminal record, he can come down and become a capitalist. That is why I'm fond of saying that one of the best ways of treating a communist is to make him a capitalist. Yes, but, but if right. you have made the communists in a, a, your country into capitalists, why should you be so afraid of the communist propaganda? I think you must realize that the dangerous communists, the intellectuals, 
will uh, remain communists uh, anyway. They are not influenced by the communist propaganda. Right. And th they will go underground. But right. the reason for outlawing the communist party, I think, must be to prevent communist propaganda. And I can see that communist propaganda would be dangerous <coughs> in a prosperous country where people are satisfied. <coughs> see, Johnny, but you see, wait, let Ram have a turn. Uh, right. The point is that the, the methods that were adopted in your country would not quite work in our country. Because right. the basic assumption was that poverty and illiteracy produce communism. But as we find it worked, it doesn't seem to be working that way. Because in India, while you do have a great deal of poverty and of illiteracy, you do not have communism uh, rampant in those sections. Paradoxically enough, communism is most rampant among the educated people, and among the rich people, and among the minority. And of course, that represents a very great potential danger. And the, the reason is to be found. I mean, why is it so? It is not what normally expects. And therefore, a different type of solution has to be found. And perhaps your solution, which you adopted in the Philippines, may not work because the circumstances are quite different. All right, it might not work. Johnny, in the wait just a minute. We've got to ah, give uh, Peter you, a chance right. to get back on his point when Ram said that <coughs> British imperialism had caused yes. communism in India. Entirely. You can't just leave it in the air. You must tell me how British imperialism. You see, the point is this: if you assume that poverty produces uh, a communism. You make that assumption, don't you? Yes. Then you see, then you have to uh, bring out the relationship between British imperialism and poverty. Now, British imperialism caused poverty in India. That is fairly obvious. Because I did what? poverty in India. Well, it has helped to perpetuate poverty in India. It hasn't helped to perpetuate. I'll give poverty. an example. For instance, you see, India was not allowed to manufacture her own cotton. She had to produce raw cotton to send to Lancashire. Otherwise, what would have happened to the Lancashire cotton mills? What would have happened to the cotton if she hadn't had a market for it? Yes, where she would she have sold the cotton? So she had to find India as a market, as a source of raw material, and therefore not allow India to be industrialized. And therefore India is poor. Or even assuming from the other ground that uh, it, is, uh, uh, it is the educational system or the educated unemployed who are communists, well, the result is because the educational system is not uh, coordinated with the economic organization. Well, in Britain, we consider that the most rampant cause of communism in India is the caste system. The fact that in your society, there must be poor and there must be rich. Far from it. In fact, uh, I think that one of the greatest obstacles to communism in India is the caste system. Oh, it is I a, can't see that. Yes, Wait a minute. You just said a while ago that, pa that communism springs from poverty. And because of that, you blame the British. Now look, the caste system perpetuates poverty in India. It prevents a man from rising better than his father was. Yes, the point can, you, can you deny yes, you go that ask in you. India you find the most extreme poverty and the most extreme richness in the world? Yes, coming to your question of the caste system and yours, you see, the point is this, that besides poverty and illiteracy, the, for communism you also require an atmosphere of challenge, an atmosphere of rebellion, an atmosphere of discontentedness. And that you do not find in India, because the caste system has taught them that the miserable plight in which they are, is, is what they deserve, and there is something that they cannot overrule, or something that they cannot challenge. But there must be some feeling of indignation against that which Precisely. breeds communism. Precisely. I cannot believe that a man would have the mind of a worm, that he would be so spineless, that he would not rebel at the position in which society puts him. Yes. Anyway, the caste system doesn't operate anymore, does it? At least for the untouchables. No, it doesn't, but uh, it is not quite so strong. But the system itself is, does exist in the villages. But uh, it doesn't in any way help communism. It's one of the chief obstacles to communism. And as far as the big gap between the rich and the poor is concerned, that is again the British. That, that is a direct result the of British, British came. rule. That was there before the British came. No, but the British perpetuated it. Do you know how the British ruled India? They ruled them through the landlords, as they called them. It was the landlords who ruled India. Before the British came, India was divided up into a small set of princeling states ruled by extremely rich men. That is right. Britain carried on that system. Uh, yes, that Britain system. perpetuated it. Yes, that's But right. they united India. They gave India the most complete civil service system. The fact that they united India does not mean that they helped India to prevent it from becoming but communist. When India, India got <coughs> her freedom from Britain, when she got her, gained her independence, she had a civil service system that gave her at least three years advance over Pakistan, because Pakistan had no comparable system of civil service. Well, Pakistan was under the same administration in the British India. That's not the point. But the point is that imperialism produced poverty, it produced educated unemployed, it produced a state of illiteracy, because I you're not educated and interesting, and therefore it produced communism. I won't, I won't listen to the word produced. Well, it, it, it caused. I won't like. hear that word caused. All right, would you listen to the <coughs> word it maintained? Maintained. Oh, it's the to same. To a lesser degree. <laughs> it's the same thing. To a lesser degree. It doesn't matter whether you cause a man to be poor. What makes it worse is you keep him poor. But if you keep him poor to a lesser degree of poverty, there oh. was some education system put into India that wasn't yes. there before. 
I agree with that. Witness the number of people who were able to write, read and write and go on to a civil service. But you must well, look, kids, let's <clears throat> take the second half of the question, because after all, British imperialism in India is now a thing of the past, is mm -hmm. it not? Yes. As we bury it, do you want to say a word or two over its... Well, I will say one thing. <laughs> that uh, British imperialism did produce communism in India. But one of the greatest events of this century has been the independence of Asia. The British have acted very statesmanlike in giving independence to India, Pakistan, Burma and Ceylon. This I will say for the British. Because if you had not given independence to India, India might have been communist today. But because you delayed the independence, you caused poverty and illiteracy. And therefore you have helped in India having a potential threat of communism. Well, how can you explain that the most uh, popular leaders of India against the British were not the communists. Well, that is because uh, the primary issue then was not against communism, but against, it was nationalism directed against imperialism. Yes, but you're saying we caused communism in your country. Surely if the, if the British imperial, imperialism had caused communism, the people would have followed communism. You see, the thing that saved it was that communism did not join hands with imperialism. Now take Indochina. In Indochina, it is just that nationalism and communism are joining hands against imperialism, and therefore there's a greater threat of communism. Johnny, what I'd, do you want to say? I'd like to say one more word over the dead body of British imperialism in India. I, Ram said, Ram said that uh, the British acted very statesmanlike in getting out of India. I'd like to say that they did get out, but they got out only because they were pins. They had to get out. There was no element of statesmanship in it at all. We got out <laughs> just in time to appear magnanimous. That's right. <laughs> So I say it myself. Uh -huh. Well, there is a pretty good feeling between the, in between the Hindus and the British today, is yes. there not? Well, well witness the fact I that even so. though India gained her independence, she still remains within the Commonwealth as no, a No, that's because she chose to, yes. That's just no relationship. Chose to. She chose to of her own Now, account. there's another half of the question we started out to discuss that we perhaps should deal with for just one more moment. That is, is there more than one solution for the problem of communism? Certainly. Well, the thing to do is that, first of all, you have to be aware that the way of dealing with communism is not to use communist techniques against them, is not to condemn them. Extremism of any form is bad. To, uh, to counteract communism in communist ways is as bad as communism itself. Yes, and I think another important thing to notice is that the worst thing you can do to combat communism is uh, not to realize what communism is. I uh, think uh, it is uh, dangerous to uh, limit the... Uh, uh, to... Uh, confuse the limits to uh, persecute innocent people. Uh, what is your point, Ram, about the future that we have to look at in India? Do you see a constant communist threat? Do you see it ameliorate, ameliorating at all? Well, I would say that communism, in fact, I'm very optimistic about the future because communism is never a long-term arrangement. Because communism really is barter. You see, you buy your bread and sell your freedom. Because, you see, the, the animal instincts in man are more fundamental than the human instincts. But the moment you get your bread, you want back your freedom, you see? And therefore, communism, in my opinion, is never a long-term arrangement. And really speaking, communism is imperialism. It is a device for imperialism. It is a new way of dealing with imperialism. In the past, for example, the other imperialists, like the British, had different ways of dealing with, com with imperialism. They made it quite explicit. <laughs> but, the, but the communists have a different type of imperialism. Now, this, they make it in such a way that nationalism is completely dissolved. For example, there is imperialism in China. China is being ruled by Russia today. But the Chinese people owe their primary allegiance not to China, but to the communist world. And therefore, they are dictated by Moscow. But as soon a time will come when China will awaken from that slumber and she will realize that she is being ruled by Russia. And therefore, I predict a bitter conflict between China and Russia. And that is inevitable. And the day that conflict comes, that will be the liberation of the world from the shackles of communism. It's a very optimistic note. Do you agree with this, John? I think that all these three people are naive in the sense that they are naive. Naive because they fail to they fail to recognize the fact that communism is not just a self-contained unit in its country. I maintain that it is a worldwide conspiracy that every communist party in the world is subservient to Moscow, that the sooner you outlaw it, the better, because the sooner shall you have a legal basis on which to proceed against them. Now, some will say that this is using communist tactics. I do not see how that can be. There may be some resemblance, but this is the point. You say that in restricting communism by outlawing it, that you're restricting human freedom. But look, when you restrict freedom, it does not always mean to say that by restricting freedom, it is bad. When you restrict the freedom of a rattlesnake, it is not bad. And the same thing applies to the communists. I think that uh, it is 
important to remember that we are not only trying to fight communism, we are also trying to preserve democracy. And I consider freedom of expression as one of the most precious values democracy can offer. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you can defend democracy by limiting the freedom of expression. You can't defend democracy by losing it. <laughs> well, what I do want you an answer for that? Wait a minute, Peter. I do an answer for that? I'd like to say that I'm not talking about limiting democracy. You say that we must preserve democracy. And the only way to preserve democracy today is to do away with communism. It depends on what you mean by democracy. Because the communists say that communism is democracy. Well, when I say about democracy, I'm speaking of the kind of society in which I now live. I will not go into any argument with the communists. When I say democracy, I mean the society in which I live. Yes, and a society with freedom of expression for the minorities. Well, I no, would... And I would. Wait, say right. give Peter a chance. He's Just only got point. about 15 seconds. All I'm right. sorry, you've got to give it to him. He a needs the last word. right word. to speak. <laughs> <laughs> I think that communism is the antithesis of freedom, and anyone who endangers freedom, who restricts it, such as outlawing communism, by the restriction of that freedom is in fact aiding communism. Well, I'm sorry, we've got to end there. Right. Next week at this same time, we'll have our final program.